Good evening. The UN's Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change just released this past week their most recent report, the first one since they won the 2007 Nobel Peace Prize for their work. They warn in the report that the climate change impacts that we're seeing now are unprecedented over the millennia, and they warn that we're now threatening the planet, our only home. What does this mean for us in the Bay Area? The climate is going to get hotter. We're going to see temperature increases of from 3 to 10 degrees Fahrenheit, potentially by the end of the century, and that's going to be across California. So what does that mean in terms of impacts? What are we going to see? Scientists are waving their hands frantically now, trying to tell us about the damage that we're causing, not just to ecosystems and species, but to the food and the water and the energy that we need to survive. At least in the Bay Area, where we're surrounded by water, we are starting to try to pay attention to sea level rise and storm surges. The bright blue areas in the map here are the areas that are most at risk from sea level rise by the end of the century. And you see from here that there are going to be some significant impacts if we don't start to change. San Francisco and Oakland airports could be underwater. Uh, we're going to see potentially key areas of our highway uh, being cut off. And also, Silicon Valley might turn into parts of Silicon Swamp. In the North Bay, the Richmond-San Pablo area is particularly at risk. Uh, Highway 37 and Sausalito and the coastline, very close to where we are, are right now, as you can see, uh, are going to be at significant risk from sea level rise. Each year, there are two to four days where we see particularly high tides, and these are called king tides. Uh, these tides allow volunteers to fan out over the Bay Area and to take photographs of what we might be able to see under sea level rise in the future. The first slide that you saw was Pacifica uh, facing wave action under sea level rise. And this is a photo of San Francisco, of course, along the Embarcadero with the seas, the bay, rising up to the street. And this is Sausalito, what the streets might look like and what they look like under a King Tides Day. Sea level rise and storm surges threaten our infrastructure. They threaten our buildings and our homes, and they erode cliffs and beaches, and they destroy coastal habitats like wetlands. And wetlands are worth a particular mention. Scientists are now telling us that coastal habitats like wetlands provide more protection for people and property in California than any other type of climate adaptation strategy, including seawalls. We've lost most of the wetlands that we have in the Bay Area since the gold rush, and virtually all of what's left could be gone by the end of the century. This is particularly true in the South Bay. So if we lose these wetlands, we lose our natural heritage and our last line of natural defense. So is there room for hope and action? Scientists are telling us that by 2050, that projections are pretty set in stone. But after that, it's wide open. We could change things right now. We could change the future if we start to take action. And many communities around the Bay Area, including right here in Marin, are starting to do just that. But before we leap forward, we, we may want to take a step back and think about what we're doing to make sure that we're actually creating positive change. Confucius wrote that it cannot be when the root is neglected that what should spring from it would be well-ordered. And this is wise advice when we're starting to think about adapting to something as significant as climate change. In my own reflections on this, I go back to jiu-jitsu. Um, I started practicing Danzan Ru in Brazilian jiu-jitsu about 10 years ago. And I remember the very first time that I was thrown uh, in a hip throw, a goshi. And I remember that the sensei explained it to me in exactly what I was supposed to do, but still, my, my partner looked very large. Um, but I tried, to, I tried to accept the sensei's instructions, and I tried to relax, and let my partner grab my gi and flip me around and throw me to the mat. And I was totally unprepared for the feeling of elation as I was flying through the air, and the satisfaction of just slapping the mat, just the way I was told, um, really embracing it. Um, I bounced right back up, ready to go again. I was so excited. Um, and, and, and those lessons are incredibly important for, for me in my own search for how we can learn to adapt to the changes that we're starting to see. Only by starting to recognize these lessons about connection and about embracing our physical and emotional connection in particular with the natural world and about letting go of preconceived ideas about what we can and cannot do, can we really start to change things.
And I carried these lessons from the mat onto my environment, into my environmental advocacy. And over the years, I've worked with many wonderful colleagues, and we together have achieved a number of solid successes in the environmental realm. But ultimately, we felt that the war was being lost. And I tried to ferret out the root of the problem. And for that, I went back to jujitsu. Again, jujitsu taught connection and how to let go of what we can and cannot do. And from these reflections, it occurred to me that the root of our problem is simple, that we don't respect nature. We, we bully nature, we try to control it, we try to subdue nature. We treat nature as merely our property. But in fact, nature is strong, and it's reacting in ways that we actually can't control. And climate change is the most significant result of our misbehavior so far. So what do we think about this? Nature is not our opponent. Nature is our partner. Nature is part of us. We need to respect nature. Our real opponent is actually our flawed worldview of people over nature. In order to have sound climate adaptation strategies, we need to adapt our awareness and our character first to recognize, as Wes was talking about earlier, our shared relationship, our shared citizenship with the natural world. And once we do that, then we can start to build climate adaptation strategies that make sense. So how do we go about doing that? Well, the first step is to recognize that nature has inherent rights. Just as all of us assume that we have inherent rights because we're born on this planet, not because a government agency uh, that would be shut down today gave us these rights, uh, but because we're in inherent, because we were born here. That same logic applies to nature. It applies to the natural world. Only by recognizing and respecting nature and respecting its rights can we create the foundation for the climate change adaptation strategies that we need to develop. And so how do we start to think about this in terms of changing how we do our laws? Um, I've been asked, what about our current environmental laws? Uh, what if we just implement those better? Or what if we take one of these new approaches like sustainable development? And the way that I respond is that both our current laws and sustainable development have the same inherent flaw, this idea of development. They buy into this larger misperception, this flaw, that, this myth, that we can have infinite economic growth on a finite planet fueled with endless natural resources. And that's just a flawed economic worldview that will create more damage. To find a real solution, we have to dig a little bit deeper. So to do this, let's try a thought experiment. Instead of sustainable development, we could start to think about something like sustainable communities, or better yet, thriving communities, where you're starting to think about the, the rights of nature and the rights of people flourishing together. And what that might look like, and what our economy would look like serving sustainable communities. Right now, people and planet are serving the economy. If we expand our idea of communities to include both nature and humans and focus on that as our goal, then we're going to see some significant changes. Adam Smith has been called the father of modern economics, but he didn't want the system that we have today. He actually praised as wise and virtuous, the person who put aside his or her own interests for the public good, and said that the chief part of human happiness arises from the feeling of being beloved. Aldo Leopold extended this vision and said that we need to be able to have a respectful relationship with land that includes love. We can express this intrinsic love for the natural world by recognizing the rights of nature. So what do we do about this here in the Bay Area? Well, we can start to ad adopt laws, uh, local laws, based on governments around the world, like Ecuador, that are starting to recognize the rights of nature in their constitution. Ecuador's constitution says that nature has rights, that citizens can enforce them, and that nature has to be fully restored if injured. In April of this year, the city of Santa Monica became the first city in California to adopt a local ordinance that says nature has inherent rights to exist, thrive, and evolve. And they're pairing that with a sustainable city plan that says that we're protecting natural ecosystems, but also we're building in resilient strategies. They have a goal of 100% water self-sufficiency by 2020, and they're going to achieve that. We can do the same thing in the Bay Area by adopting local laws that recognize the rights of nature and build in sustainable strategies.
So what do these sustainable climate, climate adaptation strategies look like under a rights of nature framework? The IPCC report said that land and water are most at threat from climate change. So let's look at water first. Climate change in California will melt Sierra snowpacks, will create more drought years. And here in Marin, where we collect rainfall for much of our water, we could be suffering from swings from droughts to wildfires back to droughts, uh, making planning for water difficult. So what can we do about that? Well, a no-regret strategy would be to adopt a goal like Santa Monica's and really focus on both our right to water and the environment's right to water. And we can do that by making better use of conservation, of capturing stormwater, as we're seeing Santa Monica's doing today and reusing it, reusing recycled water, gray water, and accelerating groundwater cleanup. These are all strategies that we can start to do, recognizing both the rights of waterways and the rights of humans. And now let's talk about land. Our food supply is being threatened by crop quality and quantity changes from climate change. A no regret strategy for food would be to adopt a certain goal, a goal of a certain percentage of food that is grown locally, to be consumed locally. And that both is mitigation and adaptation because we're able to reduce greenhouse gas emissions from the food transport. So replacing lawns with gardens or uh, celebrating locally the benefits of local food can start to be able to bring communities together in a connected, healthy way. So now habitat restoration is an important element of land as well, because climate is now changing 100 times faster than species can adapt. And we need to be able to have habitat so the coastal ecosystems can move inland with sea level rise, and that animals and plants have migration corridors to be able to move inland to a new safe home. And so natural habitat restoration also benefits us, uh, because again, creates these natural buffers against sea level rise and storm surges. And if if we do this in locally in our communities, we can reach out to local volunteers and local scientists to do the work. Again, building community with each other. Chrissy Field in San Francisco illustrates the immediate benefits that we can really see from habitat restoration. In the 1990s, Chrissy Field sat contaminated and fenced off. Then 3,000 volunteers planted 100,000 plants and created the tidal marsh, sand dune, and meadow habitats that we see today. And that was all done primarily with volunteer labor. In conclusion, I want to come back to jujitsu and to think about how when you're struggling on the mat with an opponent, uh, you're really going back and forth and countering, and you're fighting for every small sliver of space. It's a constant struggle, and sometimes it really feels insurmountable. But in that moment where you really never give up, you just have to trust your technique and realize that eventually it can suddenly tip in your favor. And the same is true with our struggle today. Our worldview of nature as commodity is a very powerful opponent. And to start to make that shift to a worldview where nature is part of us, nature is a partner, we need to trust in our physical and emotional connections with the natural world and to trust that these preconceived ideas that we have about how things can operate can most certainly change. And by doing that, we can create a thriving Bay Area that's grounded in the rights of nature from which climate adaptation strategies will arise in order to create a flourishing environment for people, ecosystems, and species. Thank you.